as Virginia Woolf said, one cannot think well, love well, sleep well if one hasn't dined well. And I see no barrier to that, no matter the age. Look, the story for me started, started when I was made Senior Australian of the Year. I didn't think I was old enough for it, but I was, <laughs> just like you, Garth. And um, in, that, in that year, in that year I, was, um, I, was asked, I was given 900 requests to speak. And I didn't do all of them, uh, but I chose the ones that I particularly thought I could you know, make some impression upon. And one was to speak to a thousand CEOs of aged care for their annual conference in Hobart. Um, now, um, because it was a keynote speech, I did a lot of research, and um, I, I went um, thinking I was taking um, ideas uh, to the audience, but it was a hostile audience for the main. A thousand people I couldn't actually see, but I could feel. Um, uh, I could feel that they really didn't want to hear, even though I, I was going with these ideas. But out of it came some amazing threads, um, uh, really amazing threads. And one was um, Dr. Stephen Judd of um, Hammond Homes in Sydney, who, who rang me and said, um, uh, come up and sit around the table with me and tell me how we can bring about change. What is the catalyst? And out of that is um, uh, Peter Morgan Jones, who is the executive chef of Hammond Homes. And I'll talk about him a little later. Um, and and it, that wasn't the only thread. There were other really positive things to come out of it too, but that was the strongest thread of all. And I feel really strongly that pleasure is something that all of us need and the good food, full of the right nutrition, is one of the most powerful ways we receive that. And none need it more than the elderly unable to do for themselves. Now, aged care homes are the homes of the residents and they need things to look forward to and nothing is more palpable than the instant gratification that's not only to do with teenagers, the instant gratification of a, a lovely meal that both smells and tastes of fresh food. So whilst food is my catalyst for change, it's kind of like the meat on the centre of the plate and many other things revolve around doing that well. So whilst that good food life I talk about is a cornerstone of a happy, healthful life, um, I'm, I'm driven to bring about change that also brings in gardens and music and, and a way of life because Often the people, well most often, the people moving into homes have had hard lives in many cases and they're often entering homes very frail uh, where they're unable to look after themselves and my feeling is that responsibility to give them more. And I know with the help of so many people that I have been able to gather around me, the marriage of specialists in their fields at the specialists in their fields so we can put science and alchemy together. Alchemy is the food, science is, is, is what's also needed because um, we have a frail people that we have to look after. So I, I started out this journey of developing the foundation green, green and idealistic. Now, I've got many other colours that have come in, but I'm still idealistic. But my gosh, have I learnt a lot. Um, and look, I, I know, I started this journey I started this journey trying to get Mark Butler, who was the Minister for Ageing of the time, um, and I went to him and said, look, I want to make change, and how can I do it? And my concept was I could find all the great places, because there are many great places, and find them and reward them with kudos. And, and Mark said, yes, good idea, no money. Um, and, <laughs> and then he got moved and I was asked to sit on the advisory board for the Age in South Australia. And I was talking about what I wanted to do. And the CEO of the board said, Maggie, if you have an award for excellence, it would be much better your name rather than the government's. <laughs> and so that is when I decided to, to, um, to develop the foundation, well, to um, to have the foundation and under my name 
um, because I want to find all these great places because when you have great places and you reward them they become benchmarks for the rest of the world the rest of Australia to follow so um, that is is truly important to me yet we have to accept that there are those in aged care not fortunate enough, fortunate enough to have the leadership that understands the importance of good food now, um, and, the, and the way it's delivered. And by working closely with those who want to embrace change um, and the joy that food, in the joy that food can bring, uh, we can create a movement of sorts and I hope to encourage all. And the one thing that I've managed to do is open the conversation so wide that um, the, the press uh, are, are behind it and we have to, um, someone said to me this morning, we have to make it sexy. <laughs> <laughs> now, now it's um, the doing and the helping and the changing is sexy. So, I, I, um, I must say that I really hope to be able to influence government, but that's a long journey to influence government. I, 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 I am practical enough, pragmatic enough to understand that, but you know. I, I'm most concerned for what I call the silent generation, as um, they're affectionately labelled. Baby boomers, when when they come into aged care, they they've spent their life having a voice. They will make their their um, uh, they will make their needs known. It's right now, it's those now that come from an era where they continue to hold faith in institutions and they believe in responsibility before pleasure and are patient and non-complaining. Um, they were our backbone and now it's time for us to give to them. Um, mind you, their families often um, um, will voice problems for them, but that's a problem in itself. But it was a shock to me to hear of Australian studies that one in two residents in aged care are malnourished. Um, this is from Professor Liz Eisenring of Bond University, one of my board members. And of course, the negative outcomes of that are to me, firstly, where is the pleasure in life coming from and what began this journey? But the physical part of this is the decreased um, activity and quality of life because of the lack of muscle mass, lack of energy and increased risk of bed sores. Someone in, uh, in, in aged care in South Australia said to me, and I hope it's not true, but they said the, the, the largest amount of, of um, the budget on aged care is bed sores. Now, if that is true, um, yes, and that was from a government person. Now, of course, obviously that figure of, of one and two ranges of, in all parts, in, from one study to the next, but it was enough to really make me real when I heard that. We know, um, and I come from alchemy, not science, remember, but I was a nurse a long, long time ago, but only for one year. Um, one year, and then I injured my back, and it Concord repat <laughs> a long, long time ago. But as we age, we require more protein, certain nutrients at the same, uh, at the same time that at the same time that appetite and energy requirements decrease. So the challenge is to maximize the nutrition in every bite. And I'm not talking functional foods. I'm talking about finding ways of bringing that scent of home cooking, the use of fresh fruit and vegetables, and please no hysteria about fat. We need fat, good fats. If I walk into a home and I see low fat yogurt, diet cordial, um, I see boosters in, uh, in the pantry, um, I tell you, it, it is, um, <laughs> yes, it's really, really distressing. But then I go into a place as I did last week in Melbourne, where the place is alive, the smell of food, a garden was had just been planted um, uh, for the residents where the wheelchairs could go up to the garden beds at this height. And one man, his name was Lee, he hadn't been out of his room for five years until they got the garden. And his delight and that smell of the food, oh. So I know there are these great places, but, um, 
it, this, is, this is just so important how we get that nutrition. Now, when I, when I um, uh, formed the board, uh, formed the foundation, I went looking for who I was going to have on the board, and I aimed high. I aimed high, and I realised if there's one thing about being in business for so many years, you always bring in people that are smarter than yourself and have something to contribute. And and so I um, on. Uh, it's interesting to know the makeup of the board perhaps to show how I think I might be able to gather forces around Australia. Um, Trevor Richards, uh, an Adelaide businessman, a strategic thinker. Professor Bruce uh, Doughton, the Vice-Chancellor of Macquarie University and a medical doctor because Macquarie want, um, they have a world-class teaching hospital and an interest in aged care. And then I went to Peter Kenny, who um, is the head of Colmar Brunton in Melbourne, a greatly respected research firm that deals with food businesses all over the world uh, and a real interest in fairness for the community. Uh, Professor Wendy Lacey, um, Dean of Law at Adelaide University, already working in elder abuse. So you can see threads everywhere. Oh, and Kevin Reed, um, uh, senior partner in PricewaterhouseCoopers, and on the board of Meals on Wheels in South Australia. So guess where, guess where my mind is going? Ah, and Wendy Holdenson, um, recently retired as the Australian Trade Commissioner in Japan, um, and developed a, an interest in aged care in Japan. So came back with wanting to give back and ideas. So, and, and Professor Liz Eisenring of Bonn University, Professor of Nutrition. So even though I don't have science, what I've gathered around me is people that do have science. Um, because I was amazed to find that there are no healthy guidelines for older Australians exist for nutrition in residential aged care facilities. And um, that, that we, have, we have regulations for everything. We are such a nanny state in so many ways, but we have no um, regulations uh, for aged care. Uh, I'm sure that's so in South Australia. Uh, it, uh, well, I know it's so in South Australia, but I think it's also right across Australia. Am I right? Yeah. And as I mentioned, their needs are very specialised and absolutely vital, but in many cases, they're not considered. So how do we overcome this uh, crisis? How do we make sure people, these people rightly receive what they're entitled to? Well, you know, sometimes it's the simplest things that immediately can make a difference. I'm working with three um, uh, homes in South Australia within my easy um, ambit of being able to reach. And Flinders University will assess the work that I'm doing. And honestly, I can't believe how simple some things can do to make a difference. And I, I visited all those homes and I wanted to cook with them, uh, but it was very difficult to go and actually cook in their kitchen when they were also cooking for 40 or 50 people at the same time. So I brought them to my kitchen just two weeks ago and we filmed, um, there were the chefs, cooks chefs, the CEOs and the kitchen hands. And what was so fantastic is I, I took one of their recipes and I very diplomatically, <laughs> very diplomatically, just showed the difference with the way of having um, fresh vegetables, making the chicken stock at the same time as I was cooking uh, the chicken pie. Um, so it, it was... Um, chicken with the skin on from a, a free-range chook. You know, all those small things that made a difference. Um, and they couldn't believe the flavour when they ate it, but it's just really beautiful, simple food. I baked the rhubarb for the dessert instead of boiled it, and they said, wow. Um, I made a creme anglaise, which is a very fancy name for a beautiful custard, and I made it in their equipment, the same equipment as they have, which is a, a, a combi steam oven that most every home has, and I made it um, in a tray that they didn't have to stand for 20 minutes over, over a, a water bath to, to get it to just set beautifully, and it was made of fresh whole eggs, cream and sugar. Uh, uh, well, in fact, honey instead of sugar. And they never have to use another custard powder again um, because the flavour, the nutrition. And once, what I've found is once you can work with people and show them how you can make such a difference, it becomes 
it all becomes possible. So we filmed this and it's going to go out in a very short time because we see that's one of the ways as a foundation, one of the ways is to reach people that are interested in change. But this is where it was so interesting in talking about being green and I made this beautiful custard and, and the, um, uh, the kitchen hand said, but that's okay if we served it straight away, but if we wanted to serve it tomorrow, we'd have to heat it back up to 85 degrees again because of, of HACCP. Well, that seems crazy to me. And so if it seems crazy, um, I've now got um, Liz Eisenring getting someone using science to see if we can rebut it. Because that's what we must do. We mustn't just accept things. And um, so finding out for problems of problems from people on the ground is truly, truly important. Now, this is where I can, I can talk about two books that are really, truly important. This, firstly, I, I had the honour of launching Peter Morgan Jones's book in Sydney a few months ago, Don't Give Me Exit Bounce. And this whole journey that I just started right to talk about right at the beginning, um, Dr. Stephen Judd um, had a little piece in the Sydney Morning Herald about in aged care, a boiled egg had to be boiled for 17 minutes to be given to aged care. And, and so that's why this book is Don't Give Me Exit Bounce. Because Stephen and, and Hammond Holmes, because he's a leader who understands the difference and we were able to find this amazing chef, Peter Morgan Jones, who has changed the landscape. Is that right, Peter? Changed the landscape of food in aged care, in, in, New South, in dementia care of Hammond Holmes. And um, having rebutted it with science, it had, to be, it had to be the title of the book. But here are these amazing recipes that are suitable for dementia care because Peter came from, uh, from having, cooked for, um, uh, having cooked for the royal family even, but he was from the five-star world. So he brought with him to aged care molecular gastronomy, a passion for food. And, and that's what he has translated into simple, beautiful food for people with dysphagia that can't swallow. Um, and it is fantastic. Um, it, it is so important. Another book, Eat to Cheat Aging. I met the dietitian Nari Hobbins. It happens that her father is here today <laughs> with a book, because this is the second alliteration of the book in, in that um, the first went out like that. Um, and what you eat helps make 60 the new 50, 80 the new 70, and I'm just about to be 70, so I hope that means the new, yes, <laughs> well, I would say 40. <laughs> but these books are so important, pointers to keep the brain going, and, and I'm also working with Professor Ralph Martins at Edith Cowell at University in Western Australia on food to protect our brain from Alzheimer's, and this all interlinks. Food is medicine. I really, truly believe in it. I really, truly believe in it. So, ah, uh, now, one of the, one of the great things um, uh, to do is I like to push a few boundaries. And when, um, uh, when Stephen and, and Peter asked me to come up and do, uh, uh, do a cocktail party in Sydney for, uh, it was for the conference of aged care people. And um, I wanted to sort of push home and so uh, uh, to look at institutionalised food against real food. So we did a cocktail party called Forbidden Fruits. And, and the idea is the media would be there and politicians would be there as well. So on one side of the plate was the institutionalised boiled egg. The other side of the plate was a soft boiled egg with HACCP uh, uh, accredited in the way it was looked after. Um, there was chicken, chicken loaf uh, that was okay in, age, in institutionalized food and there was a beautiful, um, uh, a beautiful um, uh, free range thigh with skin on, slowly cooked, deglazed with verjuice, huh? um, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and so on and so on. So, and would you believe at this cocktail party, no one touched the institutionalised food. But that is what we were, we were getting at. You've got to show, you've got to make people understand. So 
the thing that I found fascinating is so many people want to change, they just don't know how. And what happens is that, um, when I say people, I mean organisations, they write to me and say, look, we really care, we just don't know how. Now there's one thing, and that there hasn't been an accredited system for chefs in aged care. And my friend Simon Bryant is helping me, I, I drag a lot of people into this, into this arena and um, as he said uh, when we launched the foundation at Tasting Australia uh, in May, he said to be a chef, a cook or a chef in aged care is far more complex than a, res uh, than a restaurant. You have to know all about food and science and, and all the different, um, uh, the different diets. It is, really, um, it is really important and we have to have an accreditation system that's being written as we speak. Um, uh, the syllabus is being written and then then we have to celebrate them as being special and we have to give them we have to give them um, excitement and we have to involve them and we have to show them how if they're struggling because so many people work so hard in isolation and when you when you can get them and work with them or show them the simple things that can make this um, this difference, I know um, I know that um, I know that we can bring about this change. And one of one of the things I spoke last week in Melbourne at uh, the philanthropy conference, and because if you have a foundation and you want to do research, you've got to find money, and and um, the great thing about it is the audience of the um, uh, organisations are open to, to, um, to finance particular research. And so, uh, but, and the first bit of research that we're um, uh, getting the money, well, looking for the money for, and I think we've probably got it, is, is the Lantern Project, Cherie Hugo from uh, Queensland. And she's doing a piece of research that you might see is a cost-benefit analysis of what's possible when you spend more money on food uh, right at the, the front end uh, because you understand what it can do and then you don't have to spend the money on the supplements to put people people suffering from malnutrition back together. So that's an important piece of research. It is uh, this, even if it's cost neutral, um, can you imagine the benefit? Because some of the budgets are incredibly, incredibly distressing, some of the budgets. But one of the things that I'm, I'm intent upon doing is not to damn anybody but to bring people along with me to show those that want to change show them by the sharing of ideas the inspiration the tips exciting the people who work so hard just doing what they've always done thinking differently thinking differently about about everything really um, thinking outside of the square being a lateral thinker is about the only thing uh, that in in my life being persistent, positive and lateral of the only ways that I've been able to do what I've been able to do and uh, I want to bring it to this. There are so many great pieces of information about nutrition and diet and, and ideas from all over the world but there's not one repository of, of um, all these great thinking and ideas. So what we're hoping, um, what we're looking for the foundation to be is, is a conduit. Conduit for, for research, conduit for practical ideas. The, you know, the, the first month we put out the 15, um, 15 I, uh, tips for low hanging fruit as we call it. The things that you can do immediately that don't cost money to make a difference. But the, the pulling in the research about extra virgin coconut oil as well as olive oil that has, uh, has such a uh, proving that fatty acids are a powerful immu immune boosters. There's research out there which suggests coconut oil and the diets of people living with Alzheimer's has a positive influence on depression and memory. Who doesn't love a meal with chocolate? And research by the University of South Australia and many other people about um, the cocoa flavonols found in dark chocolate and how good 
good they are for us. Lutein in fresh fruit and vegetables and how it gives us more energy. All of these, all of these ideas are sitting, sitting out. They're sitting out there and they need to be pulled together. So I'm just scratching the surface here with research both proven and anecdotal. But I've learned so much that can change lives. And so this bringing it together and sharing it for the carers in the community too. Last um, uh, Thursday, I worked with 18 young doctors straight out of Flinders Medical School. And they came and they cooked with me and we talked about diet. And, and because nutrition is one half afternoon, I think, in, in their four years of, of study. So you get, it's like getting the young. You get the young doctors and know when they go out into, into their professions that they, that they respect and understand um, the issues of, um, of, of, of ageing. So the foundation's aims are that repository of information, that um, sharing of the ideas, um, awards for excellence um, where trying to establish an advocacy program where I can bring um, uh, chefs from all around Australia to work with me for days in the Barossa so I can infect them, <laughs> so I can give them the things that I've learned. But those chefs will come, or cooks will come from, in some competitive way, I haven't yet, um, you know, totally um, um, got in my mind. It's, this is just a very recent idea. But they need to be probably only 30 because I need a small group of people, but they have to be from places where they can go back and infect another 30 people. We have to, we have to get this, this um, rolling. So my foundation is the rest of my life's work. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've, I've taken on so much, but I'm so excited. When I have people like Peter Morgan Jones, when I have Nari Hobbins, when I have so many people from all around Australia that are already doing amazing work, and if we can pull them all in. So a good food life for all should be from the cradle to the grave. We are never too old for pleasure. In fact, those in aged care not only need it, they deserve it. So thank you. <laughs>